to our worship service, we get to now join together to show honor and glory to our Lord, Savior, and King, Jesus Christ. And we do that as we normally do by singing to him. Oh, 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. In the stead of by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, to forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Today's Psalm is 119. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the just decrees of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight, as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts, and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes, I will not forget your word. Celsius, but we're going to give it for a pause just a little bit longer when we all get to sing it together again on Easter morning. So the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Today's Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah chapter 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's epistle is from Hebrews 
Hebrews chapter 5. Every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And at this point, we would usually sing our Alleluia, but again, we get to put that on hold until Easter morning. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was happening to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him. And after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism which I am to be baptized? And they said, We are able. Jesus said to him, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I will be baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but is for those who have been prepared. And when the ten parted, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called to them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave or the slave of all. For even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. And now please join with me as we confess our common faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also forth under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And you will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. 
and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated, and we'll continue on to our sermon now. to be complex. Well, let us consider computer program. Computer programs. Now, I'm in no way a computer programmer, but according to the quick research that I did, I found that computer programs or software are made of lines of code, and lines of code are more or less a series of instructions. More complex programs tend to have more lines of code, but a good programmer can do more with fewer lines of code than an average programmer can do with lots of lines of code. But in any case, let's look at some numbers. Take the average game on your phone. That has about 10,000 lines of code. <laughs> Pacemakers have about 80,000 lines of code. The 1982 Space Shuttle had about 400,000. The Hubble Space Telescope, anywhere from 50,000 to 2 million. Air traffic controller systems, 1.7 million. Your, the operating system on your phone, about 12 million. Now isn't it comforting to know that the phone in your pocket has a more complex computer program than the planes in the sky keeping us safe? <laughs> All right, but however, an F-35 fighter jet, 8 to 24 million. Facebook, 61 million. High-end car software, about 100 million. 
Now this shows us something interesting. The length of a program or its complexity doesn't make it more important. After all, what's more important? A car that runs or a pacemaker that works. And then we have what some consider to be the most complex computer program on Earth. First of all, any guesses what it is? What? Well, we'll get there. Actually, Google. Google in turn is considered by many to be the most complex computer program on Earth because it has about two billion lines of code. Of code. Now, all that's interesting and something that was just said, there is something that's more complex than all of that, that which created all those computer programs, the human brain. Neurons are the fundamental unit of the brain and nervous system. They take information in and make our muscles work. The human brain has about 100 billion neurons. So, would that make the human brain the most complex thing in the universe? Well, maybe it would, but then again, maybe not. Would a conversation between two people be more complex because there's two brains involved and not just one? But then we have that which is undoubtedly truly the most complex thing in the entire universe. And that is what created our brain, but God. God is as far beyond our ability to fully understand than we as humans are, are as impossible to understand for an animal. Like God tells us, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. But nevertheless, let's try to explore one of the deeper mysteries of God, that which was revealed to us about Jesus and what we read from the book of Hebrews this morning. And it's what it means for us that Jesus is our high priest. Now, it was a stunning and, on and complex revelation for the original readers of Hebrews, but for us, it might be even more so because we have not lived our lives under the old covenant where the purpose and person of the high priest was already well understood. So it seems like we have at least two things to learn. What did the high priest do in the old covenant? And how did Jesus change the role of the high priest? And I suppose there's a third question that is implied. What does it mean for us? The author of Hebrews starts us off with something that people in his day would have already well known. For the every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. Aaron, the brother of Moses, was chosen by God to be the first high priest. Moses consecrated Aaron by way of a ceremony that involved the being washed with water, being dressed in holy garments, being anointed with oil, and the sacrifice of animals, and the blood of those animals being sprinkled on. And then after, Aaron and the rest of the priests were then expected to act as mediators between God and man by performing sacrifices and administering the laws of God, as explained at length in the book of Leviticus. Now, it's important to note that the sacrifices they performed accomplished what they were supposed to accomplish, the forgiveness of sins. In the conclusion about the law of unintentional sin offerings, in Leviticus, we are told, the priest shall make atonement for, for him for the sin which he has committed, and he shall be forgiven. In other words, there was true forgiveness to be found in the law. However, it was never the case that the animal being killed could ever permanently and truly take away the sins of humans, as is written elsewhere in Hebrews. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. But still, when the people in the Old Covenant sacrificed an animal for sin, they were doing what God told them to do, and so they received what God told them they would receive. However, they didn't receive it because the death of the animal itself accomplished anything on its own. It was more that the death of that animal pointed to and represented the death of Jesus, through which, and only through which, was all sin paid for. But of course, that wasn't made clear until the death, and especially the resurrection, made it clear. And even more than that, it took Jesus carefully explaining it to his disciples for it to be made even more abundantly clear. 
But what was it about the high priest that made him different than all the other priests? Because all the other priests could make the normal offering and sacrifices. But as revealed in Leviticus 16, the high priest was the only priest allowed to go to the most holy place, inside the veil of the innermost parts of the temple, to make sacrifices to atone for the uncleanness of himself and for the people of Israel. Anyone else that went into that most holy place would die, apparently due to the power of God alone. And even the high priest was only allowed to go there once a year. Now, the Jews in Jesus' day would have thought that the office of high priest was going to last forever because the Old Covenant seemed to reveal that was what was true. It seems as if it was supposed to last well after the lifetime of Aaron because <coughs> even while Aaron was still alive, it was written that when he died, his son was going to take, his son would replace him. And likewise, all the other high priests that died would be replaced. It was a system that seemed to last forever. Indeed, as we are told, their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. And the high priests were there throughout the entire Old Covenant, from the time that Aaron was consecrated by Moses up until the time that Judah was conquered by Babylon. And then, after the Jews came back to Jerusalem, the high priest Eliashib came back with them and helped them rebuild the temple. And that lasted right up until Jesus' day, because there was a high priest at that point. But that high priest, along with the majority of the other priests, were corrupt by then. Actually, if the high priest Caiaphas was instrumental in having Jesus killed. Indeed, it was the high priest himself that presided over the court that sentenced Jesus to death. After interrogating Jesus, he said, the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And all the other high priests in attendance said, He deserves death. Again, all this might sound odd to us because living under a high priest is just not a system that we are used to. But it was a normal, even essential part of life under the Jews. And even for some confused Jewish Christians in Jesus in Jesus day and also and importantly it was not an inherently bad system indeed it was called to be good and even perfect so it really shouldn't be a surprise that some of the Jews that became Christians felt themselves drawn back to the law and the high priest that was over it but the part of Hebrews that we read this morning proves that it was impossible for them to go back to the way things used to be, because those things were gone forever. The old covenant high priest was made obsolete, and it is a wonderful thing that it was, because now Jesus is our high priest. But before we get to that, the author of Hebrews describes what the normal high priest was like in order to better contrast them with Jesus. Hebrews says, he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the other people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, as Aaron was. Now, like we are told, high priests were just as human as anybody else. They may well have been especially godly people, but they were still just people. Their sin had to be atoned for just like everyone else's. Indeed, Aaron, the first high priest, committed a sin so significant that God told Moses, Let Aaron be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land that I have given to the people of Israel, because you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. Now, the specific sin that God was mentioning there was when Aaron and Moses didn't uphold God as holy in the eyes of the people when they miraculously provided them with water. Now, that would have seemed to have made all the high priests sympathetic to the people over whom they had authority because they would have known from personal experience that sin can overtake anyone, even those that love God, or at least that's what should have happened. But many Pharisees in Jesus' day reacted in the opposite manner. They tended to have a pretty high opinion of themselves and a low opinion of everybody else. They excused the sin on themselves, but harshly condemned it in everyone else. 
like Jesus said about them. The scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their fingers. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. And again, as we already heard, neither Aaron nor any other high priest ever chose on their own to become a high priest. Like God directly told Moses, bring near to you Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. And after Aaron died, God directly told Moses, strip Aaron of his garments and put them on Eliezer his son. And so it went. Each priest was to be succeeded by his oldest son. At least, usually it was the oldest son. If the oldest son proved himself unworthy by sinning significantly, a younger son could be chosen to be the high priest. And if anyone ever dared to take on the duties of a priest for themselves, unbidden by God, the results were terrible. In Moses' day, there was a man named Korah who was not a priest who tried to make himself a priest. And he rebelled against Moses and the true high priest, Aaron. Korah and all the people that followed him ended up being swallowed by a rift in the earth. Now, so far, what we have gone through really isn't that complicated, especially if one happens to know such a system as from birth, like the Jews in Jesus' day did. But then after Jesus died and, and rose again and taught, everything about the high priest was forever changed. Some of those changes were predictable, but others were so radical that no one ever could have seen them coming. From Hebrews, we are told, so also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have forgotten you. And as he says in another priest, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, here Jesus is called a high priest, but this is not the first time he was called a high priest in Hebrews. That happens in Hebrews 2 17 and 18. There we're told, Therefore, Jesus has been made to me like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now here we're told two things about Jesus as it relates to him being our high priest. One, he is the propitiation for our sins, that is, we are forgiven for our sins because Jesus paid for them or covered them through his sacrifice on the cross. And two, Jesus has been tempted, so he understands how hard it is for us when we are tempted. Jesus is then called a high priest again in Hebrews 4.14. We have a high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our, our confession. Now here, we learn two more things about what it means that Jesus is our high priest. One, Jesus has ascended to his Father in heaven. That means that right now, Jesus is at the right hand of God who is interceding for us. And two, knowing that gives us strength to hold fast to our confession, that is to remain faithful. And that's because if Jesus is up there interceding for us, no one down here can do anything to take us from him. But, as we are told, Jesus did not make himself to be a high priest, but was appointed by his Father. And this is where it starts to get a little complicated. Jesus was, is, and always will be God Almighty, but nevertheless, Jesus always perfectly obeyed his Father, like Jesus himself said. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And like Jesus prayed in the night before his crucifixion, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And yet, Jesus was always fully willing to do all that he did, like Jesus said. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay my life down that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to bring it up again. This charge I received from my Father. The outcome of Jesus being appointed to be our high priest means everything. For one, it means we no longer need a human priest. We have Jesus. 
Now note that is different than saying that we are our own priest or we have no priest because that's false. We still need someone to go to God the Father on our behalf. But instead of going to a mere sinful human like ourselves, we get to go to the one and only man that was also God, Jesus Christ himself. And the enormity of this change is hard to overstate. Jesus the high priest is different than all the other high priests that came before him. To start with, and I suppose somewhat minorly, in the Old Covenant, all priests had to be from the tribe of Levi, whereas Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. But the you are my son part that we read refers to the fact that Jesus is in all ways God the Father's son. And we can see this in multiple ways. To begin with, Jesus was born of a virgin, and so he was literally and physically the true son of God. And also, God the Father spoke from heaven directly and called Jesus his son on at least two separate occasions, once at Jesus' baptism and another time at Jesus' transfiguration. Now, the today I have forgotten you part also seems to have multiple meanings. Here in Hebrews, it seems to refer to the fact that God the Father appointed Jesus to be the high priest. But it also seems to refer to the resurrection ascension of Jesus because it was at that point that Jesus went to be with the Father and in so doing became our high priest. And the way that that makes Jesus a different and totally superior high priest is unlike under the other high priest, Jesus was and is God Almighty. As we're told, God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And that also means that Jesus being God was and is sinless, which again is totally unlike all other high priests that came before him. Like we're told of Jesus, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And also, Paul wrote that Jesus is a priest forever. And we know this is true because Jesus will never die again. As we're told, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. And so, we have a high priest we have the greatest high priest that we can ever conceive of, a high priest that is appointed by God, gentle, sinless, divine, and eternal. And the only possible person all those things can be true about is Jesus. He is the only high priest we can ever need, and more. So why would we ever turn to anyone else? And so, my beloved, I leave you with this. Jesus is our high priest. And now, may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now, please rise for our offertory.
Now, please rise for the prayers of the church, and during a moment of silence, please feel free, free, feel free to pray your prayers out loud. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the gift of the Holy Spirit that our Heavenly Father would write his word on our hearts and lead us to know him as the God who forgives our iniquities and remembers our sins no more. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayers. For our church workers who like all, who like all flesh are beset with weakness, that they may deal gently with us and be preserved faithful to proclaim God's word. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayers. For humility, after that after the example of Christ, we would not lord authority over one another, but serve each other in our homes, communities, and congregations. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayers. For all earthly authority, that they may be guarded from the temptation that to wield power improperly, and be committed instead to good and faithful service. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayers. For all who walk the way of the cross among us, that as Christ learned obedience through his suffering, they may also be instructed in his ways, sustained by his blessing, and in time receive relief from his heavenly Father, his heavenly Father's hand. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord God, we pray for the family of Christopher Kills who passed away suddenly this past weekend. Uh, Lord Jesus, we bring that up to you and the family up to you who are mourning this tragic and sudden loss. Please give them the hope that this is not the end. And I pray for the Christians around them to surround them with love and gentleness. And Lord God, we continue to lift up the wars in the world around you, the Ukraine and Gaza and Haiti and all of those places. We pray that you are able to bring order there and the brave men and women are able to accomplish that through your will. And we pray that justice is done. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord God, we bring up to you human trafficking. We pray you end this evil in our land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you sent your Son to be our High Priest and to be our Mediator so that we can bring all of our prayers to you. Help us to trust you implicitly. For the sake of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we turn now to the service of the sacraments. The Lord be with you. up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed heart we might be prepared to joyfully celebrate this paschal feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Now that you have received this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, so that you keep him protected your life everlasting and always remember that Jesus loves you. Amen.
We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the faith, through the same in faith towards you and fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up its countenance upon you and give you peace. You may be seated and we'll sing our final hymn. fellowship there and food there in the back but before that we have one other thing we'd like to have Jan Surrey and Cindy Squires and Jamie Cotton come up Notice that there's something about cheerful comforters in our bulletin today. Today is yesterday was National Quilters Day. And these relays plus one more Tina Homer who comes across the pass every Wednesday, most every Wednesday, to quilt for all of the quilts that are given out. And you notice that many of them are on the uh, pews today. Quilts are given to Lutheran World Relief. Well, last October, they were, there were 101 quilts. The quilters since then have 97, 97 more made. And the, I, don't, I was going to ask, how many years have the quilters been quilting? 
but they are put on over 30, over 30 years. So if you can come multiply that they've made over 3,000 quilts easily since Sherpa culture has had been born. These three ladies plus Tina Homer have been doing the major share of that for the last several years. Because quilts are given to, to Lutheran World Relief or spread all over the world. We also, they also make some quilts that are donated to the schools for auctions for their fundraisers. They also have given to Giving Tree at Christmas time at least five quilts for families. And they also donate to our mission service for our auction. And sometimes there are special people in need and they do quilts especially for them. They also make lap blankets, whatever they're called. Lab blankets, which are a little smaller. You've probably seen them about half the size of the quilt. And those go to people who just need some comfort. And the veterans. And Randall, Randall's Children's Hospital in DC. Okay, these gals and all of the quilts that they make are representatives of the love of Jesus given to our church. So we needed to show them off. <laughs> so, we have some little gifts, the gals can each of them with a flower and a card, and you look at the card and see who it goes to. Uh, Janet, well, Janice will take uh, Tina's, because Tina, there's construction on 217, and so Tina was going to come and touch and learn about that, but it may be just too much to try to get through on the Sunday night. Shamrock plants, since this is St. Patrick's Day, I thought that was appropriate. Thank you, gals. And these gals that are up, were up here giving these are part of our mission service gals, and they do a lot for our Hill Street Church, as well as the missions for our Hill Street Church. So let's give them a hand. <laughs> There's also lots of information in here about the church. Choir practice. Choir practice, yes. 